Welcome back to the second part of the webinar on best practices for phenotypic drug discovery. This has been created by the Best Practices in Medicinal Chemistry Working Group for the European Federation for Medicinal Chemistry. So far, we have looked at deciding on the right assay system and library composition to screen with, as well as how to best validate the hits from a phenotypic screen. We're now looking into the important topic of target identification or elucidation of the mechanism of action. Already in the introduction, you have learned that phenotypic screens may be more likely to deliver compounds with relevant modes of action. However, cell-based screening approaches do not directly reveal the cellular targets. Technically speaking, it is not absolutely necessary and basically more of a risk and also mentality decision to elucidate the target of a phenotypic drug, since the FDA also approved drugs without knowledge about the target. In the end, the patient appreciates a safe and efficacious drug more over one for which the target is known. But there are other reasons and advantages why target deconvolution and a detailed understanding of drug action are beneficial. With knowledge of the molecular target, there are options in modern drug discovery to accelerate lead optimization programs, for example, through the use of structural information. In parallel, a target-based program can be launched to generate additional starting points for optimization. A better understanding of the pathway also helps de-risking and to exclude potential unsafe mechanism of actions. Lastly, and this is a very important point, that with knowledge about the target or the targets of a phenotypic drug, it is easier to translate from a preclinical to clinical setting enabled by a proper biomarker development. To be successful with the identification of a molecular target from a phenotypic screen and to understand the relationship depicted on the left, a multitude of technologies needs to be employed and we are going to look into the most common ones. No single approach provides a one-size-fits-all solution and the process of target elucidation can be lengthy and resource intense. This is often used as the counter-argument against phenotypic approaches. But modern science should not shy away from this. Since probe molecules from early leads play a vital role in this process, we would like to highlight our previous webinar available from the EFMC on best practices for probes. Over the past years, a multitude of methods to elucidate a molecular target have been established. In most cases, a combination of approaches as well as high potency for the tool or lead compounds is needed to elucidate the target. The following slides are clustered around the following topics. Protein affinity-based methods where compounds with or without forms of labeling interact with protein targets, followed by omics approaches where we look into genomic tools, and lastly, additional important computational and knowledge-based strategies will be highlighted. One of the most common approaches is a protein affinity method where, generally speaking, a hit or tool compound is modified with a tag to bind and identify the protein target. This is happening in the form of a non-covalent and reversible interaction. Initially, the hit molecule is modified with a linker, this is shown in the upper box, that can be readily connected with a tag or sometimes called reporter. In some cases, this tag is introduced in a later step, highlighted here with the dark green circle. After incubation with the biological system derived from the phenotypic acid system, most commonly the lysate of cells or tissue homogenate used in the screen, the tagged molecule binds that target. If not already installed, the tag is now introduced. This and the subsequent step of capturing the ligand protein complex, including separation from unbound elements, for example, by washing steps, is referred to as pull-down. Depending on the specific technology, a combination of linker and visualization methods is used. As shown in the box on the right, several technologies have been established, and they range from binding affinity tags mobilization on solid phases to binding of various fluorophores. This approach, which is also referred to as chemoprecipitation, comes with certain challenges. In general, the effective tethering of a reporter component, 
while avoiding the introduction of unwanted negative characteristics, require structure activity relationship or SAR knowledge. Further concerns include the disruption of the primary drug target interaction and potential changes in physical chemical properties, including changes in solubility and nonspecific protein binding. Lastly, there's also the risk for target denaturation during the lysis of the cells. The technology highlighted on this slide is a more detailed example of the aforementioned. Still, the binding affinity of a tagged drug to the unknown protein target is the key, and the linker drug construct has already been immobilized on solid support, as shown in the cartoon in the upper left side of the box. In most cases, the lysate of the cells, shown here with the colored mixed components, is incubated with the drug functionalized beads in the presence of varying concentrations of free and unlabeled drug. After washing non-specific binders off, the bound protein can be eluded and identified. And more importantly, they can be quantified by mass spectrometry based methods in an automated fashion. And therefore, this is often referred to as quantitative chemical proteomics. The identification of the proteins is often further supported by comparing samples containing isotope labeled and regular protein using classic proteomic techniques. This isotope labeling is done metabolically or chemically and incorporates heavy isotopes, resulting in unique differences in the mass spectra. So if you hear stable isotope labeling by amino acids in cell culture, or SILAC, then this is what is referred to. The data can reveal the specific proteins, here shown as blue Pac-Man on the bottom of the box, that change their quantity depending on the level of free drug they are competing with. This suggests them as target proteins versus the other proteins for which the content does not change, here shown in brown circles. Such data can be visualized as dose response curves as shown on the right of the slide. The technologies highlighted on this slide are also protein-based methods, but using a, and that's the main difference, labeled reactive compound that covalently binds a protein target for subsequent identification. This has been developed to overcome limitations with the initially introduced reversible binding approach. Since key failing points of those chemoprecipitation experiments are poor target affinity or denaturation of the target upon lysis of the cells. So as shown before, a suitable hit molecule is modified with a handle or linker, but this time including a reactive linker or photoreactive linker. After incubation with the lysate, sometimes this is even done in live cells, the molecules would bind the target and be thereupon cross-linked covalently. The cross-linked protein targets are then visualized by the reporter group similar as described before. In the box on the right, we have shown well-known photoreactive groups like diazerins and azides. But this approach can also be done with so-called warhead groups, for which the only limitation is the need for reactive nucleophilic groups on the protein in proximity to the bound molecule. In general, this approach also enables hit molecules with lower affinity to be used as bait. However, sometimes a more elaborate probe design is necessary. A modified version of the aforementioned covalent approach is activity-based protein profiling or ABPP. The idea behind it is to use probes that have been developed to interact in a functionally dependent manner with protein classes, for example, proteases and kinases, by binding to a structural motif that is shared between members of such a protein class. Similar to the quantitative chemical proteomics approach, the incubation of the covalently modified drug with the protein is done in presence of varying concentrations of free drug to show those dependencies as shown in the upper right visualization method. Also with these methods, bioorthogonal conjugation strategies have been developed that enables both free compound and probe the access to their targets in live cells and even in vivo. 
Coming to the last slide of protein-based methods, this summarizes and highlights just a few methods out of a longer list. These mentioned here all have as underlying principle that a label-free drug binding can alter the properties of a protein and this effect can be quantified. The protein could be in the lysate of the cells or also these techniques can be applied to a set of recombinant proteins to get a clearer readout. And this of course needs knowledge and effort to make them available. Size exclusion chromatography or SEC is coupled to mass spectrometry and sometimes also referred to as target identification by chromatographic co-elution or TICC. The procedure is based on a characteristic shift in the chromatographic retention time profile of a protein that binds a drug compound. Also the small molecule itself can be detected by spectrometry in the respective fractions. The protein can then be characterized by further methods. The other methods listed here are more based on thermodynamic changes or stabilization of the target proteins upon the binding of the drug molecule. The thermal stabilization, for example, is exploited in cellular thermal shift assay or SETSA and thermal protein profiling or TPP. The method called drug affinity responsive target stability or DARTS relies on ligand-based protection of the target protein against proteolysis. In case of SP rocks or stability of proteins from rates of oxidation, the ligand-mediated stabilization of a protein against denaturation and oxidation is used. This is just a high-level summary of techniques and other variants have been established and your scope extended. We're now changing gear and we'll look into much different methods to elucidate targets of phenotypic screens. Target identification based on genetic or genomic methods leverages the ease of working with DNA and RNA to perform modifications and measurements in the context of genes. The effects of drug compounds on RNA, protein and even metabolite levels can be observed and compared to the native or diseased state. Most commonly, gene expression signatures or molecular fingerprints are generated by quantitative mRNA sequencing, and this is often referred to as molecular phenotyping. This can be done in a dose-response fashion to quantify effects of compounds on certain genes, resulting in possible up or down regulation. As depicted below, these profiles can be computationally compared to expression profiles of compounds with known mechanism of action, and are visualized in heat maps or advanced visualizations. The LINX project mentioned here is a public database example. These expression profiles of screening hits can then support the identification of pathways that contribute to the phenotypic changes and thereby help generating a target hypothesis. Also different clusters of compound can be compared based on their common mechanism of action and again, comparing with known profiles, undesirable mechanisms can be uncovered. As mentioned, this general strategy can also be extended to the metabolomics and proteomics of cells. Another technique that we would like to highlight under the umbrella of omics approaches is called morphological profiling, sometimes referred to as cell painting. Here, the general principle is that quantitative data is extracted from microscopy images of cells to identify biologically relevant similarities and differences among samples. Hereby, changes on cellular components like nuclei and mitochondria can be observed, and very large sets of features captured in a relatively unbiased way, typically hundreds to thousands of features. It is important to mention that this powerful technique can be used not just to support target identification, but also to study effects of genetic perturbations, screening of compounds itself, and identifying signatures of diseases. The figure below shows a typical workflow. After perturbing, staining, and imaging the cells, a software is used to extract the morphological features into a profile that can be further analyzed and compared, for example, with untreated, disease state and genetic knockouts or historical data to identify targets. 
Over the next two slides, we will look into more specific genomics methods versus the broader approaches that we have just introduced before. This slide presents techniques that use screening of compounds against a large set of expression-enriched libraries of artificially generated proteins. This relies on the strategy of linking genes to proteins and include various sources for the generation of these constructs, including bacteriophage, bacterial, yeast, ribosome, and mRNA display methods. The readout is then mediated by genomics methods. In some cases, the signal can even be amplified by genomics methods as well. These techniques are more sensitive and thereby help to identify binders to low abundance proteins and to targets to which only a low affinity ligand has been identified. One of the disadvantages for most of these techniques, however, is that they can be quite complex systems regarding their implementation. Beyond that, the non-mammalian system that is often used can sometimes not fully mimic all post-translational modifications or cofactor environment that would be required to fully represent the real target system and so can result in false negatives or false positives due to unspecific activation. To highlight a few examples briefly, on the right, the phage display approach uses bacterial phages that display, hence the name, proteins on the surface that have been cloned into them. The DNA to do this can come from any isolated RNA. These phages can now bind to immobilized small molecule probes. After washing, Phage particles most strongly associated with the compound are recovered, amplified in bacteria, and the process repeated until no phage are shed during the binding and washing steps. This leads to the enrichment of the target protein. Another example briefly highlighted here is the three hybrid system. It comprises one component that consists of a DNA binding domain shown in dark blue, fused to a ligand binding domain or LBD, which acts as an interface. Another component is a ligand molecule also just for the interface in light yellow. This is flexibly linked to a hit molecule. And a third component that consists of a, of a transcriptional activation domain fused to a protein from a cDNA library, which might be a target protein. The binding of the hit molecule to its target protein results in the interaction of the three hybrid components, which form a trimeric complex. And this complex then activates the expression of a reported gene, providing a measure of the interaction. And only cells that express this reported gene are selected, and their DNA is extracted and sequenced. The target proteins can then be identified based on sequence similarity searches. An advantage of the three hybrid system over the expression cloning approaches for target deconvolution is the fact that the interactions between the small molecules and the target proteins occur in living cells rather than in an in vitro system. The last slide highlighting omics approaches discusses genetically modified systems. The principle behind using mutational studies, summarized here under functional genomics methods for target identification, is that a test system with a mutated gene and the resulting changes on a protein level will not behave the same as the native or original test system when treated with a compound, if the compound's target is that gene in question. Often this approach is employed for the verification of a target hypothesis. So when a potential target, including its gene, has been proposed by an orthogonal method. The methods can comprise gene knockouts, for example, by CRISPR or Talens experiments, or other classic genomics methods to modify genes that we are not going to discuss here. Also, there are nowadays options to silence genes with, for example, antisense nucleotides or downstream using RNA interference methods like siRNA. Overall, these methods all are limited to observing loss of function type effects. 
This is further illustrated and explained in the graphic below. As shown in the upper box, a cell with a gene knockout can show the same phenotype as an unchanged cell that has been treated with a compound. This would suggest that the altered gene or its resulting protein, respectively, could be the target of that drug. That would then be an inhibitor or an antagonist. And consequently, in the lower box, if a cell that has been modified but does not yet show the phenotype is treated with a molecule, then again shows that phenotype, then this gives some proof that the modified gene actually is not the target. If, however, and this is the lowest example, Upon treatment of the modified cell with the compound, the phenotype is still not observed as before. It suggests that the modified gene, even if not showing the phenotype directly, could be the target of that compound. Now, this was a high-level summary of some of the relevant genomics methods used in target identification after phenotypic screening. We are now shifting gears again and turn towards computational methods which also play a big role in this part of the overall process. We're just summarizing a few key principles of knowledge-based methods here without going into too much detail. In general, one could say that computational methods are used to identify and suggest a target. These calculations or analysis come from fundamentally different methods though. First, Similarity searches can be performed to compare the structure of known drug target interactions from a plethora of drug target interaction databases with the structure of new compounds resulting from phenotypic screens. Thereby, one receives a belief score that a hit compound might actually interact with a certain known target. This would be classified as a ligand-based approach. For well-described targets in terms of structure, High-throughput structure-based docking calculations represent the second approach that can be taken to identify a target for a hit molecule. Another more recent and upcoming topic, also fostered by modern big data endeavors, are what we summarize here as network-based approaches and machine learning techniques. Since they take into account a lot of variables and data, they try to address the limitations of the above-mentioned more singular methods. For network-based approaches, multiple drug target interaction data points are usually combined. For example, drug similarity, target similarity, and the activity on these targets, plus additional data like phenotypic endpoints or off-target effects are used in complex calculations. There is a number of databases in the public and private domain. A general problem can be incompleteness of the publicly available data as the basis for the calculations. To visualize and exemplify especially the machine learning approach for target identification, let us draw your attention to the graphic on the right. The idea behind it is to use computer, very simply speaking, to put things into perspective. Looking at the known chemical space, an unknown drug or a new drug can be placed within according to its similarity to known entities. The same is then performed with the associated data, for example, from omics approaches like a gene expression profile and compared to the phenotypically derived data. By combining this in complex calculations, the computer can then build the pharmacological space and tries to predict which target the compound likely interacts with to generate this type of a profile. Still listed here as a knowledge-based method, one should not forget that also the directly available annotation data can be used. But as mentioned before in the section about the riot screening compounds, this should not just be taken for granted, meaning that simply the knowledge of a compound drug target does not preclude the compound to show the observed phenotype through a different mechanism than the one known. A solution to this is to compare the gene expression profile of the known compound and annotated compound with the profile observed in the test system to uncover any misfits. As a general summary to the knowledge-based methods, one can state that there's an increasing importance to utilize and fully exploit the synergies between known experimental results and predicted data 
to really support target identification from yet another angle. Another important, conceptually more simple approach for target identification is basically just to test the hit compound against a broad panel of known targets. These can be specific classes of targets like kinases, also to exclude certain target hypotheses, but also to generate safety data as early as possible by testing against known and problematic safety relevant off targets. Often you would then see these tests results in heat map formats or other visualization formats. In this part of the presentation, we have looked at various approaches that can be used to try to elucidate the mode of action of a compound found through a phenotypic screen. This is a challenging yet important endeavor and we shed some light and classified several affinity-based methods, omics approaches, as well as computational methods and elucidation based on known targets. The ultimate goal, of course, is to find enough proof and certainty about a specific target or targets resulting in the observed phenotype. This is often only possible by combining several methods and requires multiple pieces for success. Often you would generate an early or advanced hypothesis and then look into additional, more complex methods to further validate it. Accordingly, an appropriate resourcing of those efforts should be factored in when planning phenotypic projects. Also, clear strategic decision points are needed for the case that the molecular target cannot be identified, which happens in quite some cases, also dependent on the aforementioned resourcing. The initial medicinal chemistry work plays a critical role in this process. On one hand, for the situations where target deconvolution is difficult or has not produced results yet, the optimization of the hit compounds in the absence of a known biological target has to be performed and therefore ligand-based approaches to optimize the activity of a hit to a lead molecule with the required properties for in vivo experiments, for example, is possible. Yet, it's not the desired norm. Improvements in potency are then mostly driven using the initial cell-based assay system. On the other hand, initial medicinal chemistry is often needed anyways, and it is an important driver of early phenotypic projects. With the early SAR, not only can the hit quality be assessed, potency and selectivity cliffs be identified, but also even more importantly, the early lead compounds can be used and optimized as probe molecules for further target identification experiments. As described in the webinar, linked probes are utilized in proteomics experiments and active-inactive molecule pairs are important tools to understand the target biology. This is also highlighted in the previous EFMC webinar on best practices for probes. Furthermore, if compound quality has been improved by rigorous ligand-based methods, Early in vivo experiments are enabled and help verify the pathway in early disease models. Ultimately, this again strengthens a target hypothesis and the SAR observed can be put into perspective with modeling or docking approaches on the putative target for further validation. Finally, we have created a couple of case studies which are available through the EFMC website, again in a webinar format, highlighting how phenotypic discovery campaigns can look like in practice. Thanks for your interest in this webinar and the EFMC work. Please contact us with any comments.